my great pleasure now to have a representative of the third member of Quad, Australia. And in that process, uh, the Honourable David Fawcett, the Deputy Chair of the Joint Standing Committee of Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, is also is heavily involved in the Joint Committee of Intelligence and Security and was also Assistant Minister for Defence for four years up until 2022, will give it, be, be giving a presentation now on the strategic outlook facing Australia. And the question is, how might Bradley, Roosevelt and Dunlop marriage strategic tensions in the Indo-Pacific? Now, most of you will have heard of uh, General uh, Bradley, uh, President Roosevelt, but you might be scratching your head about Dunlop. You're about to find out. Well, General Erling, thank you for that uh, introduction. And, uh, High Commissioner, can I thank you for your contribution? And, as you said, India has been a good responder at times of crisis. And I just want to put on the public record and thank you for uh, India's efforts to make sure that during the COVID crisis, supplies of spun bond uh, did actually come from India to Australia as contracted to enable the production of respirators and surgical masks here. That was critical at the time and we appreciate India's support. So Roosevelt, uh, Bradley and Dunlop. Why have I chosen those three? Well, this is the last of a presentation or last presentation of a number. Uh, and generally in these things, other people steal your thunder. Uh, speak about the things that one would have spoken about, so you need to find a way to actually engage with the topic. And uh, I particularly want to acknowledge uh, Professor Brady, who uh, actually appeared before the uh, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security when we were doing a lot of work around Australia's uh, national security laws, countering foreign interference, uh, espionage and influence. And uh, your work, Professor, has been very informative and useful for our nation, so thank you for that and for setting the scene here. But I'd like to start today uh, by acknowledging that we are in the week of the 80th anniversary of Operation Chastise. Now, for those of you who don't recognise the name, I'm talking about the Dam Busters uh, in the UK. Uh, 1943, the war had dragged on. The Allies were desperate to degrade the Nazis' uh, war machine, the enablers to it and they looked at where they actually produced most of their steel in the Ruhr Valley, the dams there that provided hydroelectricity that enabled their steel production. So the assistant chief designer of the Vickers Aircraft Factory, who had been sitting in his backyard skimming stones and then marbles across a pond thinking how he could potentially use this to sink battleships, suddenly realised that this was a way to get a high explosive charge up against a dam wall and drop it down. Having failed to convince the Air Force that they could try and design an aircraft to fly at 60,000 feet to drop a, a very high charged weapon down with sufficient accuracy, he did manage to convince them that they could fly a Lancaster bomber at 60 feet by night at 232 knots without night vision gear, mind you, uh, and actually get the profile they needed to achieve the mission. Three months later, for those of you who are in the procurement of capability world, who've just taken a couple of years to prevaricate on what we do about long-range precision strike, three months later, Wing Commander Guy Gibson, aged 24, was appointed the CO of 617 Squadron, stood up specifically to rehearse and practice for this mission. Uh, in May of 1943, 19 aircraft, 133 airmen, took off to fly that mission into the Ruhr Valley. Two dams were breached successfully uh, and the resultant reduction in Germans' steel production, 23% of the pre-raid production was what they had afterwards. So quite a significant change to their ability to sustain the war effort. Of note, Eight of the aircraft didn't come back. So very high loss rate. But there's some significant lessons that come out of that that we should never forget. One is the importance of supply chains. A nation that goes to war doesn't just need to field a capability on day one, but to be able to sustain it at month one, year one, potentially year two or three. Supply chains and resilience are important. Secondly, innovation. 
modern warfare is moving quickly with technology. And the ability to innovate, think laterally about the ways to achieve the military or diplomatic outcomes that you need as a nation or as an alliance, closely coupled with the manufacturing, engineering and certification processes to bring things into service rapidly, perhaps you could even use the term minimum viable capability, all of that requires investment in that uh, intellectual property, in those processes and that competence, which, as the High Commissioner said, sometimes nations have been denuding themselves of that kind of industrial capability. And the third part that is a lesson we can learn from Operation Chastise is commitment. Sometimes people have looked back at the world wars and they've said these were wars of aggression and of wealthy companies and common men and women were sent like lambs to the slaughter, ill-informed, not knowing what they were really getting themselves into. Guy Gibson, having led the mission, having flown in the dark at 60 feet, two small searchlights giving him his height, therefore actually making him a target for all the defenders, having dropped his store successfully, came back and flew accompanying the subsequent aircraft five times to draw the flak from the other aircraft. That kind of commitment, that kind of belief in the mission, which was to defend a democracy against a totalitarian power, is the kind of commitment we need to make sure that our citizens understand and have and value the freedoms and the rights that a democracy provides to the extent where they are prepared to defend it. Powerful lessons coming from Operation Chastise. So we come to managing strategic tensions in the Indo Pacific and great power rivalry. So, as has been eloquently discussed by the speakers today, uh, clearly the great powers, China and the United States. And when I say China, can I also qualify? I predominantly mean the Chinese Communist Party. And I think it is really important that we do actually delineate between a race or a nation of people and their political system. Because if you recall, in World War I, Japan was an ally. Japan helped transport Australian troops to the Middle East. We then fought against the Imperial Japanese Army, taking a more totalitarian approach in World War II. And again today, Japan is a member of the Quad. They're our ally. And so when we talk about China, we've got to remember that there are people of Han Chinese origin in Australia, in Malaysia, in Singapore, uh, all around the world, many of whom, and if Tiananmen Square is anything to go by, even on mainland China, who do not support the Chinese Communist Party. But we at the moment are engaged in a strategic contest of wills and worldviews against totalitarian regimes spanning from the Chinese Communist Party to Putin's Russia, to North Korea, to the Ayatollahs in Tehran. Uh, there is a re-emergence of a conflict between a worldview that is about individual rights, rule of law, authorities being accountable to their people, and a totalitarian worldview that says might is right, and if I have the might, I have the right to exert my will over you, regardless of the impacts on people. So that contest is alive and well. And how do we as a middle power actually influence that? And what I want to do is use those three key leaders from history just as a lens, if you like, to have a look at what we are doing that we should actually continue to do or develop further, and what are the things that we could be doing differently, that asymmetric approach to a whole of nation, a whole of democratic world view to shaping the environment so that we avoid the war. There may be tensions, there may even be coercive economic measures and other types of conflict, but what we want to avoid at all costs 
uh, is the destructive nature of a kinetic war. Uh, but the way to do that is not to shy away from it, but is to engage and prepare. So Professor Bradley, Brady really succinctly laid out what it is that we're looking at in terms of uh, the contest. And what we see is two great powers, the US and China, the CCP. And if you look at President Biden's words at the East Asia Summit, uh, about free, open, prosperous uh, Indo-Pacific region, you look at China's words about win-win and community safety and security, both sides seem quite reasonable in their words. But you've actually got to look at actions. So democracy is not perfect, Churchill said that, and we've all proved it, but it's better than the alternatives. And you've got to look at what people and what nations and systems of government are characterised by. And so despite the words of those two leaders about their approach to security, you know, China's global security initiative, what are their actions? So whilst we are giving the Pacific Islands, for example, patrol boats and helping the Pacific Islands Forum Agency guard against illegal fishing, there are fleets of CCP-sponsored fishing vessels raping and pillaging the fish stocks through not just the southwest Pacific, but right across near South America as well. Uh, while we are, they are talking about collaborative security and everyone benefits, win-win, you just look at things like the China-Vietnam oil uh, crisis in 2014, where there were military and coast guard vessels literally challenging Vietnam's rights to uh, drill for oil, explore for oil in its own economic exclusion zone. You just got to look at uh, Japan's experience where from 2012 the number of excursions by PLA and vessels, not just into their EEZ but into their national waters, went from two or three a year into the tens and dozens per year. Uh, and to the High Commissioner's point before, skirmishes, actively planned skirmishes on borders with other nations. There is a, a pattern of behaviour that is not about win-win. It's about how do we get our way despite the rules. And so it's important to have that framing as we look at what we need to do. And so Theodore Roosevelt. Now, most people would remember that Roosevelt was famous for his foreign affairs policy, which was talk softly and carry a big stick. And that's where most people leave it. And it is important uh, to have the big stick, but there were five components. And the first was the big stick. It was to possess a serious military capability that meant other people had to take you seriously. But then there were other components. And the next component was act justly toward other nations. Never bluff. Only strike when you're prepared to strike hard and to be willing to allow the adversary to save face in defeat. And so it's talking about a nation which is governed by values that has respect for others and values justice, not just what you can gain through power. So as we look to apply his big stick with all those five components... Uh, what you see, and it was acknowledged in other speeches today, the Defence Strategic Update of 2020 has highlighted that we don't have 10 years anymore. In fact, if Secretary Blinken um, from the States is correct, it could be as early as 2026 that we see major conflict breaking out in the Indo-Pacific region. And that means that we do need, as now reinforced by the DSR uh, this year, we do need to expand and make more resilient the military response options that are available to government. One of the things I do support with the DSR is the concept of a national security document because diplomacy and military go hand in glove. They're not completely separate activities and we should have a national approach uh, to that. It means that we do need to invest in innovation, just like um, the Dam Busters raid. And so things like AUKUS, it's not just about submarines. In fact, in this context of potential conflict in the Indo-Pacific, they are well beyond the time frame we're talking about. Pillar 2 
is where we see the potential for us developing, in conjunction with trusted allies, new capabilities that will give an edge uh, to our shared military and security endeavour. Much as it pains me, as an experimental test pilot, to say it, one of the things that I think is a really great example of good innovation is the GhostBat program. Uh, an unmanned but essentially fast jet, weapons capable aircraft. Why? Because if we're going to have resilience, a small fleet, and 75 odd aircraft is a small fleet, uh, of exquisite high end capability is not resilient in the long term because of the small numbers of people who've been trained to operate it, because of the issues with spare parts through the supply chain, and just the sheer numbers of losses that a conflict would bring about. Whereas something like a ghost bat, which is a lower dollar value, could be produced rapidly, could be deployed uh, with a lower risk profile to absorb uh, initial contacts and recurrent contacts, uh, is the kind of resilient capability that we can produce here that we do need to be investing in. The other thing we need to be doing, and this is one concern I have with the DSR, where there is a plateauing of funding coming into defence, is we need to be investing in the force in being. Because procurement programs are all well and good, but the reality is, if Secretary Blinken is correct, those of you who are in uniform or those who you command will most likely have to put their lives on the line with what we currently have in service. And so the sustainment funding for obsolescence, for upgrades, just for basic maintenance, as equipment ages, you pass a bucket and it actually increases. And so at this point in time, rather than plateauing or, in reality, decreasing funding because of the amount of what we call absorbed measures which are being taken from other parts of defence uh, to fund even things like our contributions to Ukraine, uh, I have a concern that the force in being uh, is not getting the kind of sustainment that it needs to be available for training and therefore preparing a deployable capability, uh, but also available in terms of the redundance and resilience you need to having deployed sustain a capability overseas. The last point I'd make about expanding our military response options is around risk. Now, chapter 12 of the DSR looks at uh, this thing called minimum viable capability and risk and how we need to engage with risk. Uh, one of the concerns I have, having worked in defence and in defence industry over a number of decades and now in Parliament, having done a number of inquiries here and engaged with the ANAO, there is a consistent pattern where projects have gone off the rails, either failed or have been late or too costly or have not delivered what we expected and it was a poor management, or in some cases a lack of engagement, of competent people or entities to assess risk as a project comes into the procurement cycle. Uh, to address that, I've actually just last week tabled a private senator's bill into the parliament to establish an independent statutory body to do the work in a similar manner to what the US have done under Title 10 with the dot and &E organisation. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you can find it on the web. Uh, it's the Defence Capability Assurance Agency. There's an inquiry scrutinising that bill at the moment. Any of you are welcome to make a submission. If you like it, say so. If you think it's wrong, say so. If you think it'd be improved, say so. But this is your chance. Democracy is a participation sport. You have your opportunity to actually have a say into that area. But to uh, the issue of acting justly and the rule of law, uh, we need to actually make sure that the things we do, for example, the Pacific Step Up or the increased engagement that DSR talks about with the Pacific, needs to be on the basis of not just what is good for us from our strategic perspective, but what is good for those communities. What are their needs, their genuine needs? How do we do the right thing by them because it's the right thing to do, not just because it suits our strategic narrative? And lastly, the preparation being prepared to strike hard when you need to. That goes to the concept of having the capability and the intent and the commitment to use it. So we've talked a bit about building the capability of the big stick, but the second two parts about intent and willingness are really important. And as I've discussed 
and I think a couple of other speakers spoke about in the post-Cold War period, people were saying, we no longer need to invest so much in defence. We can build our economies, we can do all sorts of other things because the threat has diminished. What we're seeing now is that the threat of totalitarian states has not diminished, it is on the rise, and we do need to invest. But we need the will of people in industry, in academia, uh, in our communities, to say, we will take an economic hit if that's what's required to provide deterrence. Or worst case, we are prepared to put life and limb on the line to protect our democracy, the freedom, the rights for individuals that come with that. And you've seen that uh, in the last few years the government has stood up to economic coercion from the CCP and you know we have had a number of measures taken against us but the country has been resilient and those kinds of steps, whilst we were criticised by many in industry who saw trade opportunities going, are important if we had a signal our capability and our will to actually defend their values. And why is that important? You can go right back to 1938, Neville Chamberlain, when the Nazis were looking to invade Sudentland. Madeleine Albright, I think, got it right when she said, and I quote, that the British peer Neville Chamberlain called the conflict between Nazi Germany and my native, as in her native, Czechoslovakia, a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. Less than two years later, the Nazis were bombing London. And a lot of analysis has indicated that if Britain and other countries had stood with Czechoslovakia, the German calculus in terms of their ability to invade and prevail could well have changed, potentially averting the course of World War II as we know it. And so the having the capability and clearly indicating your intent and will to use it is important. Study the Falklands War, April 1982, General Galtieri. Uh, the same dynamic occurred there where they thought the Brits did not have the capability nor the will because Thatcher was actually talking about having a, a referendum of the Falkland Islanders and ceding it back to Argentina. And that gave Galtieri the green light in his view to seize the opportunity. So it's important as we consider current day events, would President Putin have invaded Ukraine if he thought that the West had the will to stand up and support Ukraine, if he thought the Ukrainians had the capability and the will to mount the defence they have? And the answer quite possibly is no. We'll never know that, but quite possibly. And so as we look at Taiwan and the CCP, uh, strategic ambiguity has been the policy for decades. I put it to you that perhaps we would be better to have an unambiguous position. Any unilateral declaration of independence you're on your own. Any unilateral use of force to overtake, we will defend. I think that would be a much clearer statement of intent for both parties uh, in terms of deterring the chance of conflict. So General Omar Bradley, some of you may have known his, he had a number of famous quotes, but one of them was, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics. Logistics, logistics, Logistics. If you look at what the CCP are doing, their Belt and Road Initiative, and a whole range of things that, again, that the Professor uh, talked about, it comes down to logistics. Um, yes, there's the, the legacy part, the 100 years of humiliation. You know, President Xi would like to, to have his reputation being the reunification of Taiwan and establishing uh, China as a world leader again. But a lot of it is about logistics. They import more than 70% of their oil, more than 40% of the gas. They are the world's largest <coughs> importer of agricultural products. Australia, our economy, rides on our exports of iron ore. Uh, and so logistics is actually one of the drivers of the tensions that we see. COVID-19, bad as it was, was a blessing in disguise in some ways of opening people's eyes to the impact of long and vulnerable supply chains where we do not control things that we think are necessary for the quality or security of the life that we have here in Australia. If you're interested, uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade uh, in 2020, which I was chair of at the time, um, did a report looking at the lessons of COVID for our foreign affairs, defence and trade policies. And it goes a lot to this whole concept of supply chain security and the High Commissioner mentioned uh, initiatives around supply chain security. Have a look at it because it is important about the times when it may be appropriate for government to intervene rather than just trusting 
a global market-driven provision of goods if we think they are critical. Some goods we need to actually design, produce here. Some things we need to get from trusted partners with government-to-government -government frameworks around commercial arrangements uh, so that we know that you know, whether it's us providing rare earths to others or others providing goods to us, that we can rely on that. And there are some things, perhaps your thongs to wear to the beach, we really don't care. We can get those from anywhere. Uh, but the report is, is a useful study on what we learned from COVID and it applies very much to how we move forward in this space. Um, the other thing I'd say from a defence perspective, for those of you who may be involved in the procurement uh, area, it's not just a case of having the, the new capabilities, the ships, the planes, the tanks, whatever, weapon systems, on the tarmac, in the port. You actually have to be able to fuel them and arm them and sustain them. And largely that means we need resilient supply chains and a viable defence industry sector. Again, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at the 2015 report of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, looking at defence industry and exports, and it was a document that underpinned the 2016 Defence Industry Policy Statement, which worked with the First Principles Review to say that the defence industry is actually a fundamental input to defence capability. Because if you need to modify something, repair something, get it certified, put back into service, upgrade it to meet a new or emerging threat. We have many examples in recent history where our allies have been absorbed elsewhere uh, from both an engineering and a manufacturing perspective. And if you don't have that sovereign capability in your own nation, then you are no better than a third world nation in terms of your ability to field an effective force, sustain it and make sure it's effective against the threats. And I know there's a constant tension uh, within defence about our budget is to buy capability, let's buy it from Europe or America because it's the cheapest and it's going to be the best. But if you can't sustain it in month two, year two of the war, if you can't arm it, then it's actually a false economy. And the last point I'd make is that sometimes the perfect gets in the way of the good. So for precision guided munitions, uh, I have watched with some frustration what I think is the uh, internal debate within defence in terms of where we should go for PGMs and manufacture here in Australia. If Secretary Blinken is right, and we are talking 2026 or that kind of time frame, the reality is young men and women will go to war in the platforms we have today with the weapons that are already integrated on those platforms. Therefore, Raytheon produced something like 85% of the weapons we use. The AMRAM, which is in NASAMS, then on the aircraft, the SM series of missiles on ships, Tomahawk, there is no other choice. Not that I don't get paid by Raytheon, but there is no other choice if you want to actually have a capability. So partner with them. They've been identified as a strategic partner. But what we now need to do is go to the US government and say, we want you to approve parent company to export the IP so we can get an environment, an ecosystem of SMEs that can work here to produce the AMRAM, for example, so that not only Australia, but Indo-PACOM, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, other nations in the Pacific who rely on that weapon can actually have a second <coughs> supply chain. Because if you look at the productive capability of Raytheon in the States and the FMS sales approved by the State Department, they could not produce enough to do a week two loadout for all the people who've ordered it if you had a simultaneous conflict in Europe, Middle East and North Asia. Uh, <coughs> Those kinds of decisions, to my mind, no pun intended, are not rocket science. Um, but they're often being made by people who have not been involved in the engineering and certification process that drives the time frames to get things onto aircraft or into ships. Uh, so there's a, a change in our attitude that we could be doing. Now the other change, this is where Dunlop comes in. For those of you who don't know Dunlop, so Edward Dunlop, weary Dunlop, uh, surgeon, uh, he's best known for his time as a prisoner of war on the Thai Burma Railway and the work he did to save many lives of allied and indeed local people there who were in slave labour uh, at the time building that railway. Whilst he was famous for that, some of the contributions that he made that are relevant, I think, to this debate today go back to his time in the Middle East. 
when he was over there, he actually developed the concept of the mobile surgical unit that would go to where people were injured as opposed to waiting for them to come back. And his commitment was so much to the people that even though he had opportunities to go into administration and strategy within the, the headquarters, he opted to go back to where the need was. And so he was in Tobruk operating as a surgeon. And when troops were redeployed from the Middle East back to Australia, he was on a ship that got diverted to Java. Uh, and that's where when Bandung fell, he was taken captive and headed off. But the two things, he innovated in that concept of taking the health service to where the people are. And secondly, making that the priority because that was the felt need. And so when we look at our region here, the Southwest Pacific, and we talk about great power con uh, competition, Frank Bamarama, as uh, not the, the military dictator, but as the Prime Minister, um, said in May 22 when Penny Wong was visiting, our Foreign Minister, he said, our greatest concern isn't geopolitics, it's climate change. And that is a true narrative that, that the Pacific Islanders have. But the one that comes very closely behind that is health. Because most of the islands are small, with small populations, they can't sustain the kind of tertiary health facilities that they need, whether it's a cataract surgery or for heart surgery or for many things that we take for granted in our society. And so over the years, it's been a priority for DFAT and for other aid agencies, private sectors. You know, we have volunteers. There's a guy called John Willoughby uh, in my home state of South Australia. He's a keen sailor, which is how I've known him originally. Uh, he's actually sailed his own boat from South Australia to Tuvalu. And he's gone back to Tuvalu on a number of occasions to do cataract surgery there with a small team. He's just recently got an OAM for that work. There's people out of America, volunteers to do that. People out of New Zealand, volunteers who do similar things. The US Navy send their mercy ships, the big steam-driven hospital ships, once every year or two, go through the Pacific, provide some services. It's all good, but it's not predictable. It's not normally done in partnership with the authorities, and so they can't plan a health system on that. There is one model, though, where we have got it right. The Senate Foreign Affairs to Instant Trade Committee, which I was on at the time, did an inquiry into our aid to Papua New Guinea, and one program stood out. It was a group called Medical Ships Australia. They're actually a faith-based NGO based out of Darwin, but they've been working in PNG for over 12 years now, working to the PNG government and the regional authorities with funding from us to the PNG government with a big hostel built catamaran which is now a hospital ship. They provide primary health services, tertiary health services, they have small boats that go up rivers, they have helicopters that go inland to bring people to the ship uh, and they take students out of Port Moresby University, dental, nursing, medical etc to provide them training. Lots of great references from the PNG government to supporting this approach because it's a true partnership. They can plan on it, they rely on it, they know when it's going to happen. There is no reason why we collectively, free democratic nations, couldn't expand that across the Pacific. The American Navy is in the process of replacing their Mercy class, the two steam-driven hospital ships, with a fleet of hostile built uh, EPFs, their catamarans with medical facilities on board. Uh, if nations joined a program to have a number of those vessels dual use in a conflict, you could use them for hospital ships in peacetime, provide the basis of that service to the Pacific. And so rather than trying to meet the CCP's engagement with the Pacific, you know, elite capture and brown paper bags and other things that people are concerned about, that we wouldn't go down that path, meet the genuine need of the people. Uh, the express need that their health ministers, as recently as last year, said was one of their highest priorities, was meeting those health needs of people. It's not military. It's building on stuff that's already been happening. Companies like Aspen here have been doing good work in Fiji. Uh, but it's a sustainable, visible demonstration of the goodwill and capability of the free world to support these free nations, winning hearts and minds and building relationships of trust. So look, in conclusion, we need to accept the reality that this is an emerging conflict again between totalitarian views of the world and free democracies. We need to actually make sure 
that we are willing to defend it. As Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected and handed on for them to do the same. Uh, we've got to accept that the key enablers to prevailing in this include resilient logistics, a clear commitment to having um, military capability and the intent to defend our values and the partnerships with like-minded partners to meet the felt needs in our region so that we are not just the partner of choice, we are their partner full stop. And finally, winning this contest requires that we provide the ethical and effective governance at home and international affairs combined with an understanding of history such that our citizens actually value living in a plural, free, open democracy and that they're prepared to sacrifice financially or if needs be, physically, heaven forbid, to defend the values that underpin the freedoms and the rights that we have come to enjoy and expect to be able to pass on to our children. Thank you. Thank you.